when we talk about theology of the body and we talk about where we stand in terms of our identity with God, we always go back to the very centrality of like who we are, right? Um, we, we understand that we have a genetic makeup. We do understand that we as adults understand that genetic makeup, do we not, right? But some young minds, undeveloped minds, uh, are still trying to get that formed in them, right? We can agree. Dr. Greg Pataro of Catholic Psych Institute says it's really important to recognize that they're there being children and young people whose minds are still developing. Um, sexual development is so fragile and the influence of what, <laughs> um, what popular, uh, what's popular in the cultural needs to be really strongly filtered and studied and understood. Like we, we can't be content with just allowing kids to understand their body as their identity by what the world tells them. Are you guys familiar with Fulton Sheen? Oh, praise God. Oh, yeah. um, I asked that one time and people were like, uh, excuse me, come again, right? Um, well, Fulton Sheen has this awesome talk on the diabolic. And, and within that talk, he says a very simple thing. He says, when, when the church stops talking about things, the world will start taking it over, right? And, and how true is that? The church, in some way, shape, or form, has stopped talking about the theology of our body. In fact, it got so bad that the word sex became taboo in the household, right? We just don't talk about that. Think about this. As a kid, were you ever curious about your sexuality and bought it up? in some way, shape, or form, or were ashamed, ashamed to bring it up, therefore you never asked, and then you explored elsewhere. We all have a past, we've all been through it. I went through the public school system, and I remember going through sex education as early as fourth grade. And they're like, do you know that you have sexual organs? And I went back home to my mom, strong Latino family, Right, my mom was a an, an old farmer woman, and my dad was a strong, charismatic Catholic. Right, and I was like, "Guess what? I have a sexual organ." <laughs> and he's like, "What did you say?" <laughs> you know, and it's like, "But they taught me it in school, and like, is it not true?" You know, but we just could not talk about this stuff. So what happened? We growing up became ashamed and it became something that we didn't talk about so that we discovered it ourselves and we let the world define it for us, right? I can't tell you how misconstrued my mindset was on sexuality growing up because it was influenced by not the church. The church just refused to talk about it. Why? Because we weren't equipped. But we were, we were best equipped for it. Right? But it's a tough topic to talk on. How do you train your catechist on this? How do you train um, a priest to go up and give a homily and be like, hey guys, today we're going to talk about, you know, like it, there, there is some tough, nuancy things that come with sex and sexuality. In fact, when you hear it, I bet you you still cringe. Right? Yeah. We have a very PG version of the cross. That's PG. Because according to scripture, he was naked on the cross. Now, how much of us would absolutely have a conniption if we saw a depiction of naked Jesus on the cross? We all would. Why? Because in the mindset of theology of the body, we still view nakedness with shame. Do we agree? That's the case for us as adults who have formed minds. Can you imagine these kids who are still trying to form it? Check this out. These are some statistics that I just want you to just hone in on just for a little bit. Um, these are coming from individuals who have a same-sex attraction or, and now we're getting to a point of an and or, have gender identity issues. Okay? 81% of them have still not shared it with their church community. What are they afraid of? What is going to happen if they share it? You already know, correct? It's not going to be the response that they think they're going to get. But let's move on. 
69% of them feel that they have no one to talk to. That's a high percentage of loneliness, ladies and gentlemen, to feel you have no one to talk to. I was just watching an episode of, of, of this, this doctor show, and there was this kid who kept acting out violently. And the parents are like, we don't know what's going on. And the doctor's trying to talk to this kid, and the kid, or the parents finally disclose that the kid is deaf, that he can't, he can't hear. And they're like, well, have you taught him ASL? They go, no. Oh the kid's lashing out because the kid doesn't know how to communicate. He feels isolated, 69% of them. 46%, even in a culture that is accordingly more accepting, are still dealing with harassment, bullying, and some sort of violence against them because of their experience, their orientation, and so on and so forth. Why? Because of exactly that. People are looking at the why and are forgetting to look at the who's that are involved. It gets worse. I'm not an alarmist, but these are facts, okay? Don't read this one yet, because I want to talk about this one exclusively, but I'm going to go right here to the middle. 57% of them cannot talk to their families about what's going on. Can you imagine not being able to talk to your family? This is supposed to be the community that you go through through thick and thin, correct? And 57% can't even talk to them about it. 53% are unsure that the church will accept them. Okay, now, before we start going off kilter and start creating hypotheses in your minds that Oscar is saying, all are welcome. Yes and no. We still have a truth to abide by. But we have hearts that we need to minister to first. You can't tell somebody the truth if they don't trust you enough with their heart. Do we agree? Mm -hmm. My wife would have never said yes to my proposal if she didn't trust me with her heart. Now we come to the alarming number. 45% of them attempted suicide. 45%. That's just about less than half. According to the Harvard Public Safety review and census, about 7% of people who have attempted suicide will ultimately succeed. Okay, so let's put this in perspective, folks. We're not talking about ideologies, we're talking about souls. We're talking about people who are very desperate in and of themselves to just be seen, that go unseen, and then the ultimate end for them is just an end. If that doesn't shake us to our core, then we need to revisit our Catholicism. Because according to the gospel, according to the, the practices of Jesus Christ himself, the man of mercy and compassion, we ought to have compassion. And if you look at the word compassion, it's a Latin word. It's a word that means that you will suffer along with. You will ache with them. Compasión in Spanish, right? But what do we do instead? We say, but this is my ideology and it's mine versus theirs. And only the strong can survive. If you thought 2020 through 2022 was bad because of the pandemic, did you guys see the epidemic that was happening prior to an actual physical virus? The divisiveness in the church, in our country, in our ideologies. <clears throat> Have you ever walked into a room and said, Hey, I don't know about you, but I'm a conservative Catholic. Or I don't know about you, I'm a progressive Catholic. Have you ever heard those terminologies thrown around? When did they exist? 
Where in the Bible did they talk about that? Because me growing up, I just thought we were Catholic. The closest thing to separate was which donut do I want? Separate those, filled and not filled. But here we are. We're not talking about the whys. We're not talking to the identity, the orientation. We want to talk to the people. The people. How do we talk to the people? How do we even bring it up? First, I'm going to give you two major conversation tips. Number one, speak to the person, not the orientation. Look beyond their orientation. Someone said to me one time that um, they, they know that somebody is committing the sin of homosexuality. And I'm like, how do you know? They're like, because they wear rainbows everywhere. I get, okay, understood. I proposed the question back. I said, how many people in this room right now are unfaithful to their wives or unfaithful to their husbands? He goes, how am I supposed to know that? You understand what I'm saying? We presume the sinner and forget about the person. Now again, before this goes viral and I end up on the church militant website, <laughs> I am not saying that all are welcome in the sense of let's forget that there are truths that we need to abide by. I'm not saying that. We live through the gospel, the gospel truth. But we are not the guard dogs of that truth. I was at a Catholic camp one time and they brought in a bunch of kids from the inner city. I grew up in the inner city myself. And I was like, what a perfect opportunity for me to minister to inner city kids being from the inner city myself. And we're about to celebrate mass and this kid, he's got this awesome flat brim hat, right? They call it a fitted cap. Right? And it, it's good. And it, it, they're like $40 hats, right? So to him, he's dressed for church. He's got his $200 sneakers, $50 pants, right? His hoodie's probably, who cares, from Walmart. But altogether, collectively, he's a $300 piece suit. And I say, yo, my man, you got to take off your hat. He's like, why? I'm like, because that's what we do in church. We take off our hat. He goes, all right, whatever. And I walk away and I come back. He didn't take off his hat. Okay, now how many of you starting to cringe inside? <laughs> right? Take off your hat, guy. So I come back and I go, my man, you gotta take off your hat. He's like, but why? I'm like, because we at church. And that's what we do. We take off our hats when we're at church. Now I'm getting frustrated with this kid. Just take off your hat. He goes, get out of my face, man. And he reacts. He gets real mad. So I go back and I'm pacing. I'm at mass. And I'm pacing back and forth upset. I'm like, God, how dare he disrespect you like that? Wearing his hat in the church. I'm about to take him out of this church. I'm about to pull him out by his hoodie. How dare you disrespect Jesus? And God put on my heart, who asked you to be my guard dog? <laughs> who asked you to go in and say, hey, take off your hat? Because guess what? When I called you, I didn't call you to be an apologist. I didn't call you to be a liturgical warrior. I called you to be my lap dog. To sit on my lap. I love you, you love me. I go, God, I can't get a reputation in the streets being a lap dog. <laughs> <laughs> so he asked me to humble myself and apologize to this guy. I go, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I called you out like that. He goes, bro, I don't know what's going on here. They took me off the streets, they've been feeding me, they've been taking care of me. I'm dressed up thinking that I'm doing the right thing by getting dressed up. And here I am in front of a God that I don't even know and you're asking me to take off my hat and I don't even know why I'm supposed to take off my hat. Now who did the grave injustice? Was it the kid who wore the hat to church who thought he was doing a good thing? Or the guy who knew better and thought he was God's guard dog? Some of these individuals have no idea what they're doing, but yet we're holding them to a standard of gospel. 
What did Jesus do? And Enoch brings up the Samaritan woman. And you guys heard the woman at the well because this is the approach that we've been basically teaching you all to like take when we take hard topics, right? The well approach. I'm gonna up it up and I'm gonna introduce through this topic how we should speak. But I'm gonna introduce another woman in scripture. And that's the woman that got caught in the act of adultery. They got put before Jesus as a trap by the scribes and Pharisees and say, hey, we, we caught her in the act. So now there's no doubt that she has sinned. She's not, they're not presuming her sin. She's not just dressed like someone who might sin. They caught her in the act of sinning and brought her to Jesus and said, the law commands that we stone her. What do you say we do? That not a trap or what? Right? But Jesus is no clown. Jesus is not dumb. He knows what the scribes and the Pharisees are doing. And what does Jesus do? I, I get very nerdy when it comes to scripture. And this moment's about to happen right now. But Jesus just starts writing in the dirt. You ever ask yourself, what, what is he writing in the dirt? You ever grow up in CCD and be like, what is he drawing in the dirt? I like to go into like, he's writing people's sins in the dirt, <laughs> right? No, I don't know what you did, <laughs> right? But he's writing in the dirt. Do you know what else God writes in the dirt? In Exodus, when God takes his finger and writes on the stones, the laws. Yes. And here, God made flesh is writing there. Hmm. If I were the Pharisee and I studied scripture like a scribe, and I understood the law, and I understood the scripture, and this guy is taking his finger and writing something in the dirt talking about law, I'm sorry, you know what that brings my mind to? The law. Why didn't they do anything? He said, if you without sin have no sin in you, as he's writing on the dirt, then go ahead, cast the first stone. He's giving him permission. He says, do it. If you have no sin in you, go ahead, grab that stone and knock her out. No one did. They walked away. And she's like, why? And basically, it's like, if they don't condemn you because they realize that they're sinners themselves, then I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Oh, people forget that part. Right? Because we want to go all our welcome. And then we forget that we're supposed to call people to holiness. Which is not exclusive to just us. It's a universal right and calling to all baptized Christians to be holy. So this is what we implement when we talk to individuals about these hard topics. That scriptural model. We protect. We protect them. We have to. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says we, we have to protect them from every sign of unjust discrimination. We must avoid that. The church says that. We have to show compassion. How do we show compassion? Well, they don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. Now, again, I don't want to go viral, but let's make a clear distinction that there's a difference between judgment and condemnation. Judgment, we can make judgment calls. If my kid is playing on the street, in the street, I can make a judgment call and say, stop, that's dumb. You can get hit by a car. If you see somebody Walking along the train tracks, you can make a judgment call as a loving neighbor and say, hey, get off the train tracks. You're going to get hit by a train. Condemning is when you do nothing and you say their life has nothing to do with me. And then your response is, the heck with it. There's a big difference between judgment and condemnation. He says, I do not condemn you. 
But it's obvious that he made a judgment about what she did, the act, because he's telling her to not do it again. So what do we do? We show compassion by loving who they are, images and likeness of God, than what they've been created as. <coughs> and then we challenge them to holiness. We challenge them. I have a friend who is homosexual. I talk to him a lot. And I ask him the same questions that I ask my heterosexual friends. Are you frequenting the sacraments? Are you, are you staying holy? Are you praying? I don't presume that he's out there living a party lifestyle. I ask him like I ask anyone else. So we challenge. And then we accompany. That means we walk with. We do real good at doing this. We don't do so good at doing this. And we always fail at doing that. We think that this is the call of holiness. To challenge sinners. If we're doing it together. Amen if we're doing it together. If we're just doing this, this, this is a stamp of pride. Where we think we got it all together. If I'm going to be personal about it, I'm a sinner. I didn't even want to give the talk until I could go to confession. Because I wanted to be able to say, if I go viral, I was in a state of grace. So whatever I said came straight from the Holy Spirit. Period. Well, this is what we ought to do. If our family matters to us, then aren't we willing to die to ourselves to make sure that they make it to heaven and have the best route of getting there? Guys, you can force a new driver on the freeway after only two days of driving, or you can keep bringing them to the parking lot and showing them how to drive and teaching them how to merge and teaching them how to be good drivers, or you can just throw them in the midst of this highway and expect that they're not gonna get clipped, that they're not gonna end up in an accident. But that's how we treat people who are not well equipped as you are. We expect to put them in the driver's seat of holiness and say, go fend for yourself, and you got it. Where in all actuality, they don't. The gospel has called us by twos not individual warriors. So, as much as Irina and I would love to say, hey, guess what? Here's the magic saying. When someone comes up to you and says, I struggle with, or I am a woman, or I am a unicorn, or I am whatever, then you say this, and boom, magically, they're converted, and, and all is good. If we can do that, then we wouldn't be in this hot mess, right? If we had the answer for it. But the solution too is accompaniment, calling to holiness, showing people through compassion and protection. As Catholics, we need to safeguard, but it's not ours. <laughs> We become so protective of something that belongs to our Lord. It belongs to our Lord. So in conclusion, I want you to know that at the heart of evangelization to our brothers and sisters that are presented with a very unique trial and a very unique call of sacrifice through their same-sex attractions or their gender confusions, that, that we need to reveal to them their dignity and their universal call to holiness. As one person told me that struggles with this, she says, you know what's unfair? Is that people are breathing down my neck about living a chaste lifestyle and I have never had sex with someone that I've been attracted to. But yet, I know many heterosexuals that have, and no one's talking to them. 
You want to change the culture, we change our view of the theology of the body. Period. Period. So what we want to do is give you an opportunity to first soak it in. Right? And then give you also a chance to ask questions. Now, we will ask to the best, we'll answer to the best of our ability, but like, we aren't the way, the truth, and the life. Um, we can just point you in different directions. So with that being said, everyone take a collective deep breath in, let it out, and now this uncomfortable roller coaster ride has come to a little end, and now you guys can process by asking whatever your heart desires at this point. Thank you so much. I have, a que I have a question. I think sometimes we just feel so afraid. We're just afraid. We don't want to say the wrong thing, so we are mute. And what we want to do is just say, you know, God loves you, and just what you're saying. But we just, it, it's this whole thing, we, we're attacked, you know, right away. Well, you're Catholic, and you don't like this, and you don't want this, and think, whoa, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Where did you hear that, I guess, is what? Maybe we could say, but it's true. You you just stay, and then you just become mute, mm -hmm. and it's not right because God does love all of us, and we need to share that. Yeah. It's and so and true. we do live in a culture that's it's very cancel prone, mm -hmm. right? I know that's a that's a hot buzz thing, and it's a very politically driven phrase. But we we ought to because we live in a culture that says you are guilty even when you are innocent. So it is a tough place to be in. But Jesus, at the risk of being stoned himself, did it, right? So canceling, if I'm going to be transparent, did I want to come give this talk? No. Why? Because I know it's on camera. <laughs> and they're going to play it back. And I know someone's going to watch it. And they're like, at minute uh, 145, Oscar Rivera said this. Explain yourself, right? <laughs> but like, you get what I'm saying? So like, yes, there is. But I also know that if I'm relying on the gospel, yeah. and I am loving my brothers and sisters that are struggling, and I know that my heart's desire is to eventually celebrate with them in eternity, then cancel me all you want. You just misunderstood where this is all going. You get what I'm saying? One of the suggestions, sorry, I would give it to you when they say that, like, just show Jesus who Jesus is, present him a couple of the, the parables, like we just mentioned today, the Samaritan, uh, how she had, I don't know how many husbands, and then now, so I, I think it's, it's a good way, because uh, most of them don't know Jesus, don't know the gospel, so I think that's one of the ways that you can share a story from Jesus himself. Amen. Yeah. We, in my family, um, I have a gay brother, and the thing that gave him the greatest strength was he came out to my parents, they looked him straight in the face and said, but you're still my son. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the suicidal behavior stopped, the reckless behavior stopped. As a matter of fact, he took care of my father until my father died. We have an offspring of a brother who is transgender. Mm -hmm. Our only problem is occasionally we call her she instead of he. And then it just starts a whole... Well, it's just she and he, excuse me, he is still a member of the family and we accept her decisions, mm -hmm. his decisions. We just have problems with genders pronouns yeah, yeah. in the family and it, and it gets very hard when it, especially with the pronouns because everything you know it, it, there's a lot of confusion and again when the church stops talking the world starts to define a lot of different things um, there was this this girl in our group in our youth group back in Virginia um, I won't I won't say her name but she would always want to be referred by a guy's name every year you know, today I'm John, uh, next year I'm James, and so on and so forth. And I, I knew her because I was in this job for like about 12 years. 
right? And like I knew her as as this little first communion girl in her white dress and, and by her name. And she was like, I, you need to call me by my name. And I'm like, I am, my love. I'm calling you by your baptismal name, the name that was given to you before God, right? But I'm not going to fight her on it, right? She wants to be called by a different name. So I said, okay, I'll do you a solid. You and I are going to come up with a creative name that I can call you. But I'm not going to call you James or John, right? So I said, Caleb, can I call you Caleb? And she's like, why Caleb? I'm like, because when I say your actual name, the K is very predominant. And when I'm around you, you're super loving, right? And it so happened to be the Christian station that plays down in the South anyway, <laughs> right? So I was like, can I call you Caleb? And she's like, I love that. I'm like, Caleb it is, right? And she could come in dressed as whatever she wanted, but she was always Caleb to me. It does get very muddy water when now there, there are things like individuals going to jail because they're not announcing someone's pronoun, you know, and so on and so forth. It does get muddy. But as long as we continue to speak to the who and to the heart of who, who we're speaking to, then listen, there are some of our great saints went through some massive persecutions. We had the problem. I, you know, I have known him as a she for longer than I've known him as a he. Mm -hmm. So we came to a compromise. We called her him M. M? M. <laughs> That's awesome. And it was a deal that the two of us made. And the, the, the respect has to go across the table, folks. And, and that we can't be afraid to not only accept, but like respect us, too. Like we have a moral compass. We have, you know, we can't just all of a sudden abandon what we believe as Catholics so that we can... Their respect is across the table. A perfect example, the guy that I told you that, that's homosexual that I know, me and my family went down to New Orleans to actually do a retreat and we met up with him at lunch. It wasn't a like, oh, I don't want my kids to see him because I don't want him to like, you know, whatever. And like this, this is somebody who's a friend of mine and I want them to meet him. You know what he did? Out of straight respect, never mentioned anything about his partner. Never even, and in fact, they didn't even ask the questions, are you married? Where's your wife? All this other stuff. When asked the questions, because they're very inquisitive, you know, they asked you a ton at your marriage, yeah. right? And he was just like, you know, I just do the best that I can down here, mm -hmm. you know? And like, that's it. Respect begets respect. And we have to also let them know that, they, you know, we have to meet each other with that respect. So for, for kids growing up in the faith who have same-sex attraction, and I apologize if you have a hard time answering this, but um, for, for like our kids and our grandchildren that come to us and say, I have same-sex sex attraction, but my faith is telling me that I'm disordered. Mm -hmm. Here, you, you're my family, you're the people I trust, they care about me the most. This is my chance at having romantic love? Am I supposed to go without romance in my life? Am I disordered? Do I still, am I still welcome in the faith? Or, how, how do we answer that? Um, that is a tough, that's a tough one. Um, and you know, I'm gonna tag you into on this because that's very theology of the body. Um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church does go as far as saying the disorder of homosexuality because it's it's not within the natural law, right? We can't be defined by our sexual urges and desire to show intimacy physically all the time. There are numerous people that can't show intimacy physically that are still able to be intimate with their partners or express a sense of love without the sexual act involved. The problem is that most people, not just in the homosexual community, but in the heterosexual community, believe that sex is the ultimate ends of desire exchange. 
of intimacy exchange. And because that becomes the case, there is a sense of like, now I'm not able to love. But, but that's not the case. Because if God designed us, male and female, to have sex for the sake of procreation, then the sex in and of itself, although desirable, like, right, there's, there is a passion that comes behind it and there is a pleasure that comes behind it because that's the way we're designed, is not the full definition of love. And I think where we go back into this is revisiting what love is, what that intimacy is that they're trying to share with somebody else, the same sex and so on, and, and start pointing in the direction of like, but sex is not just that. I don't know the sexual uh, relationship that my friends have with their partners. I don't ask, they don't share, right? But if they've ever been tempted to, I stop them and I say, I don't share my sexual stuff with my wife. You know, we're not gonna hear this stuff here. But I also share that me and my wife have an intimacy that goes beyond the bedroom be on sex. And if we can't be comfortable with saying that, or they can't be comfortable hearing that, then there is there is a sense of disorder in how we define love. Does that make sense? I was gonna say that too. We're called to redirect our desires. Mm -hmm. Whether you have the same sex, uh, you know, uh, sex uh, attraction, whether, like you, ju you just said, that's what I was gonna say. We are called to uh, for the ultimate fulfillment, which which is God. So the way you you answer it's it's a heavy word disorder, mm -hmm. but you can say that that goes for everyone. I I know we all know couples they're struggling with pornography, pornography a man in a marriage. So that's that's disordered. So that's how you can you can you know um, start from and then call to holiness, universal calling, chastity. This is for all of us. So there's different ways that, um, so you should redirect your, um, your passions, your um, sexuality, and that's the, towards so the, the, the actual ultimate fulfillment, which is God, and then, um, yeah. Because disorder is a trigger word. Anyone hears disorder? Um, do you know that we all struggle with adjustment disorder? <laughs> do you know that we all struggle with that? It's in the DSM. If, if you know what the DSM is, basically the Catechism for Mental Health, right? And anyone who struggles with, oh, I have to move, this is stressing me out, this is causing anxiety, under the DSM is called an adjustment disorder. It, you're having a tough time adjusting. The problem is that we put so much power in the word disorder and individuals also feel as if it's just them. But when we start pointing out the things that are disordered, mm -hmm. sin is disordered, period. And it's not discriminatory. And it's not exclusive to any specific person. It's a disorder. So redefining that. So if you want to diffuse the disorder thing, start pointing out things outside of their things that are disordered. And I think that is gonna that's gonna carry a ton of weight because as the statistics show, they don't want to be feeling like they're left alone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Does that makes sense. You're the only ones that are going through that. Yeah. Thank you. There are some good points brought up, um, certainly dealing with mass media, the culture, which is a huge generalization, if you will. <coughs> but as you brought out, uh, it's individuals talking to you and using your more or less as a uh, light post, uh, lamp post, a standard uh, to get your input as to what, um, how your life lives. Um, how you can bring people to God. Um, I think as far as the, uh, the sex goes, we don't talk enough about the alternatives. Mm -hmm. I mean, after you're 50 years old and you're married 20 years, you're still best friends, very intimate, more so even, because mm -hmm. you've gone through the struggles. But sex is something of the past. Yeah. And we need to talk about things other than sex that make you intimate, make you care, make you want to hang out with your best friend. Yeah. And again, we don't act so focused on mass media, sex, etc. 
that we, we just don't talk about other alternatives. And, and it's basically we've replaced love with with sex, right? Like a lot of kids today believe that the only way that they're going to express their love for their boyfriend or their girlfriend is to have sex with them. Literally, that's if if you were to ask anyone and they were to be very transparent with you, how do you express love to your boyfriend or girlfriend? A high percentage of them would be through sex because that's how you show love, and it's we've given it so much power. Um, again, I don't want to get like super theological, but there are four different types of love, and one of those is that eros love, which is a very intimate, physical love. But outside of that, there's different types of love. I I talk about this type of love now to my kids, and they're like seven and eight. You know what I mean? So I say to them, like, what kind of love do you have? for your friend. And they're like, uh, the, the Greek one for, for brotherly. And like, filio? And they're like, yeah, that's the type of love I have for them. It, it kind of feels like my brother, like my sister. I'm like, is it the same love that I have for mommy? And they're like, no, ew, no, not that type of love, right? And I'm like, do I love you like I love mommy? And they're like, no, right? And so like, having these conversations with them, and I think this is where the generational tide starts to change, where we need to gain back this understanding and be not afraid to engage the culture with the truth in the sense of like, it's okay to say the word sex. It's okay, I mean like, they're young. I still haven't introduced sex to, to our kids, right? But like, it shows, study shows that the, the younger you start to talk to them about the dignity of the human person, the more that it clicks after the fact. Do you know that my, my daughter, we were at, um, I forgot what it's called, it just got renamed, but what used to be known as Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Plantation, right? Um, we were out there and she noticed um, a child with dwarfism, right? And she looked and she smiled and then she waited till he walked away and then she came to us. She goes, can I ask a question? And I'm like, yeah, go ahead, mama. She goes, I don't understand why people would make fun of him. Like, do you understand, like, and she's trying to teach me. At this point. Like, do you understand that if, if you were to take off everyone's skin and they were just seen from the inside, we all look the same. And I go, that's a very morbid thing to say, my dear. <laughs> but yes, you're absolutely right, right? She had a boy call me on my cell phone one time, no right? Awesome. And this kid calls me up at a baseball game and goes, hi, can I talk to Cecilia? Oh. And I go, who this? <laughs> this is Demetrius. I go, time out, Demetrius. <laughs> Cecilia, why is Demetrius calling my phone? She goes, Demetrius. And I'm like, where are you laughing at? Why are your face turning all red? Why are you blushing? She's like, I like Demetrius. I'm like, oh. <laughs> right? So I pass her the phone, and because out of respect, right? I'm like, Demetrius, I'm going to pass the phone. You can talk to her for one minute, and then don't ever call this number again. Right? So she talks to her for like one minute. He's like, hi, she's like, hi, Demetrius. And I'm like, all right, wrap it up. And they hang up the phone. And she goes, why are you frustrated? And I'm like, baby, because I got a boy calling my phone asking for you, and you too young for that. She goes, oh, you think I love him like you love mommy? <laughs> no. You told me to like people because of their character, yes? And I'm like, oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> right, this is where it backfires. And she goes, Dimitri is the only one who doesn't make fun of me in the classroom. And everyone makes fun of Dimitri because he's black. Uh -huh. So he and I get along because no one likes us. Uh -huh. Come on. I mean, Dimitri is yet to call my phone because I told him, don't you dare. <laughs> anyway, I talked to him. Any other questions, comments, complaints, and concerns? You can share those too. <laughs> awesome. Well, in closing, I want to pray for you guys. We want to pray for you guys. For the people that you know are struggling in, in their lives. Whether it's a grandchild, whether it's a child whether it's, it's someone that you know, right? And at the end of the day, the who of the matter is what matters the most. We're gonna bring them to truth, the way Jesus Christ bought the adulterous woman 
in the way that Jesus brought the woman at the well to truth. But we want to lift them up in prayer because their trial and their sacrifice is very unique. We won't know this because we're not going through it, right? But they're the ones that need our support and accompaniment spiritually. So what I want you to do is just bring to the forefront those individuals, those relatives, the grandchild, the child, the friend. Just bring them to the forefront. I don't want them to be alone. Now I want you to think of someone who's not struggling with that, but is struggling with the disorder of sin. And bring them to the forefront. There's someone who's dealing with alcoholism, or addiction to pornography, or infidelity to their wife. Maybe it's a drug addiction. Maybe it's just addiction to self. And now, let's pray for all who deal with a disordered life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we bring before you all the individuals that we have brought to the forefront of our minds those who deal with a life that is disordered from what you have called us to, a life of grace. We ask, Lord, that you be with them in their loneliest time. That you be with them in their most confusing times. That you embrace them when they feel misunderstood You embrace them when they're contemplating the most desperate. Jesus, reach out like you reached out to the woman caught in the act. Protect them from the buffets of the world, including those who claim to follow you. Show them compassion and mercy, but challenge them to a unique holiness and a sacrifice that you yourself knows best, a death to self. We ask this through the intercession of our Blessed Mother who held you at the cross. Hail Mary, full of grace, grace. Lord Lord of the Lord. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you guys for coming out. We appreciate um, anything. We'll stick around if you guys want to talk to us personally about anything um, in regards to this or any other best practices. Uh, but in the meantime, know that we will be carrying those people that you did bring um, with us in prayer and continue to pray with you as you love them as we're called to. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you.